Since submitting his thesis in 1977, professional philosopher William Lane Craig has spent a good deal of his time and a great deal of his energy advancing, as best he can, a limited number of arguments, arguments which he considers provide evidence for the existence of his God. In doing so, he has attracted the support of Christian apologetics, for whom Craig has become a hero, a talisman. And Craig's notoriety has increased still further as a result of recent debates that he's had with the likes of Sam Harris and the late Christopher Hitchens. So given the support that he has mustered, should Craig, or his arguments, be taken seriously? Here are his top seven arguments. Number one, why anything at all exists. Number two, the origin of the universe. Number three, the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Number four, the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world. Number five, the very possibility of God's existence. Number six, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And number seven, the immediate personal experience of God. My first point is to note that all but one of Craig's arguments can be, have been, and still are used by people of different religions to argue for the existence of their particular God or gods. Craig's arguments are as supportive for the existence of Zeus, Allah, Thor, Medusa, as they are for Yahweh. And if an argument, or series of arguments, can be used to reach a number of mutually exclusive conclusions, then this must seriously undermine the persuasiveness of those arguments or argument. Further, it is staggering that he includes point seven. People claim to have personal experience of being abducted by aliens, seeing ghosts, of previous lives, or fairies. And the weakness of this argument is something that Craig recognizes himself. When it comes to engaging in a conversation in the public square, or in letters to the editor, or in conversation with co-workers, then I think it's critical that Christians be able to present objective evidence in support of our beliefs. Otherwise, our claims hold no more credibility than the assertions of anyone else who claims to have a private religious experience. The very fact that Craig includes personal experience in his top seven arguments is indicative of the frailty of his overall position. As for his other arguments, the best one can say is that they are well rehearsed, well practiced. So a possible so, world is not a possible world a in this context is not a, a planet or, any or a universe or any object. kind of concrete it's object. It's just a world description. The actual world the is the description world that is true. Is the description Other that is true. possible worlds, Other are, possible worlds that are, are descriptions true, which are not in fact but true, but which might true. have been true. To say that something to say exists, that something in, exists some in a possible world is to say, is to say that, there that there is some, is some description, description of reality. There is a serious point behind playing these clips, apart from just making mock of Craig. And the point relates to his resurrection and use of the ontological argument, and his conclusion that God is good. But before we get to that, there are a few more general points to make. Do not, in fact, exist. But there is some possible world in which unicorns exist. On the other hand, many, On the other hand, mathematicians, think many mathematicians think that numbers, for example, exist in every possible world. Another tactic which Craig is keen on using is to seek to give credibility to his arguments by appealing to authority, or as I call it, name-dropping. The philosopher Derek Parfit says, David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, wrote, as the physicist PCW Davies explains, according to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, as Anthony Kenney of Oxford University urges, according to the prominent New Testament critic Gerd Ludemann, Roger Penrose has calculated, Michael Roos, a noted philosopher of science, explains, but to compare that game, Peter Millikan, Gilbert Ryle Fellow and Tutor, Hereford College, Oxford. Stephen Law, Senior Lecturer, Philosophy, University of London. Arif Ahmed, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Philosophy, Cambridge. A.C. Grayling, Professor of Philosophy, University of London. 
Michael Tooley, President, American Philosophical Association. Shelley Kagan, Clark Professor of Philosophy, Yale. Victor J. Strenger, Adjunct Professor of Philosophy, University of Colorado. The reason that I've cited these people is that all of them are professional philosophers. All of them have had public debates with Craig, which are available on YouTube, and all of them disagree with him. My point is this, simply because an argument is arbitrarily labelled as a philosophical argument made by a professional philosopher, it should thereby gain greater weight or credence, or that it cannot be unchallenged, is a nonsense. Craig's arguments are not accepted by mainstream philosophy, nor are they unchallenged. And whilst on this point, it should also be noted that when Craig appears to be quoting from someone, caution should be exercised, a point that Sam Harris highlighted in his debate with Craig. Now, incidentally, you should not trust Dr. Craig's reading of me. Half the quotes he provided from me as though I wrote them were quotes from, from people I was quoting in my book and often to different effects. So. Further, Craig has no interest in the truth or interest in discovering the truth. If you visit his website, you can easily find his CV. From that, you will see that since 1996, he has been a research professor at Talbot University, and also, since 2003, a visiting professor at Wheaton College. These are the only two connections he has with academia. The Talbot University website includes a doctrinal statement. Amongst other things said in that statement is this. The Bible, consisting of all the books of the Old and New Testaments, is the Word of God, a supernatural given revelation from God himself, concerning himself, his being, nature, character, will and purposes, and concerning man, his nature, need and duty and destiny. And so it goes on. As for Wheaton College, on their website they have a statement of faith which includes in it, We believe that God has revealed himself and his truth in the created order, in the scriptures, and supremely in Jesus Christ, and that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are verbally inspired by God and inerrant in the original writing, so that they are fully trustworthy and of supreme and final authority in all they say. Both of these statements are an embarrassment to any academic institution. They are the very antithesis of what an academic institution should represent, namely the promotion of free discovery and understanding and learning. Imagine a reputable university that had a physics department with a mission statement that said, we believe that Newton's laws of motion are inerrant and unchanging. We are committed to further the works of Newton who we believe is the greatest physicist ever. The very fact that Craig has associated himself with these two institutions, and only these two, is sufficient, in my view, to dismiss Craig as any credible academic. And if you think that my statements about his interest in the truth are bold or unjustified, then here it is, from the horse's mouth itself. And my view here is, that the way in which I know Christianity is true is first and foremost on the basis of the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart. And that this gives me a self-authenticating means of knowing that Christianity is true wholly apart from the evidence. And therefore, if in some historically contingent circumstances the evidence that I have available to me should turn against Christianity, I don't think that that controverts the witness of the Holy Spirit. In such a situation, I should result, re, uh, regard that as simply a result of the contingent circumstances that I'm in, and that if I were to pursue this with uh, due diligence and with time, I would discover that in fact the evidence, if I could get the correct picture, would support exactly what the witness of the Holy Spirit tells me. Turning now to the ontological argument, this is classically described as follows. We define God as the greatest possible object of thought. Now, if an object of thought does not exist, another, exactly like it, 
which does exist, is greater. Therefore, the greatest of all objects of thought must exist, since otherwise another, still greater, would be possible. Therefore, God exists. Craig's version, as you can imagine, is much longer, but he helpfully summarizes it as follows. Premise 1. It is possible that a maximally great being, a.k.a. God, exists. 2. If it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. 3. If a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. 4. If a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. 5. Therefore, a maximally great being exists in the actual world. 6. Therefore, a maximally great being exists. 7. Therefore, God exists. Now, if that sounds to you as if Craig has merely used the ontological argument to think into existence, his God, then I would not disagree with you. And as Bertrand Russell went on to say, this argument has never been accepted by theologians. It was adversely criticized at the time, then it was forgotten till the latter half of the 13th century. Thomas Aquinas rejected it, and among theologians his authority has prevailed ever since. But not only has Craig resurrected the argument, I think he's added to it. Listen to his argument again. Thus, by definition, God is the greatest conceivable being, a maximally great being. So, what would such a being be like? Well, he would be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. He has extended the definition of greatness to include goodness. And thereby, Craig has set himself up not only for criticism, but embarrassment. Unfortunately, you'll have to wait until part two before I can expand on that. But in the meantime, if you are wondering who might buy into Craig's argument, or the ontological argument, meet Shock of God. The first one is called the ontological argument. The ontological argument. Is it deals with what's called possible worlds. And when we're talking about possible worlds... A possible world is just a way the world might have been. For example, there is a possible world. There is some possible world in which unicorns exist. But there is no possible world where you can have a married bachelor. Like the concept of a married bachelor. He is the highest, most powerful, most excellent being. God is by definition the greatest conceivable being. And if it's possible to have a God in, like this, in every possible world. He exists in all of them. Even the atheist philosophers, they'll tell you that even if it's possible for God to exist, then he must exist. Most philosophers would agree that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows that God must exist. And now the atheist must show that it's impossible for God to exist, what they can't do. The atheist has to maintain that it's impossible that God exists. Therefore, God exists. 